Perfect. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you all so much for joining us today. We're gonna to get started uh, with our program today. Welcome to Justice in Public Health. I am going to jump right in. My name is Lauren Eldridge. I'm sorry, my name is Lauren Jones. I got married recently, so I'm still adjusting. Um, and I am the Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion for the School of Public Health here at the University of Minnesota. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. Minnesota comes from the Dakota name for this region, Minnesota Makoche, which loosely translates to the land where the waters reflect the skies. It is important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with our tribal nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough. We must ensure that our institution provides support, resources, and programs that increase access to all aspects, aspects of higher education for our American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. Thank you all for coming to the event. The Justice and Public Health uh, series was started last year as part of the School of Public Health's commitment to justice and anti-racism. We've been hosting monthly events with local and national experts around topics of public health. The speakers and presentations in this series help us to ground, help to ground us in theory and practice, as well as complement the classroom learning that our students experience. We also hope that today's discussion is part of broader change happening outside of the School of Public Health. If you're interested in staying abreast of other justice and public health events, please help us by filling out the event evaluation after this and check out check the box to receive notifications about upcoming events. You may also visit our website at any time to view the recording of this event or other events as well as uh, stay abreast of other events that we have happening. Now I want to introduce our speakers for today. Dr. April Shaw will be our first speaker. She's a staff attorney at the Network for Public Health Law's Northern Region Office. She has expertise in breaking down the policy impacts of laws and appellate writing. Her current work focuses on race, racial health equity and suicide prevention. April earned her PhD in philosophy from the University of Colorado at Boulder, specializing in social and political philosophy with a focus on gender justice and critical race theory. Betsy Lawton is a senior staff attorney at the Network for Public Health Law, where she provides legal technical assistance, delivers presentations and lectures, and builds connections in many areas of public health law. Before joining the network, Betsy spent over a decade working to improve water quality as an attorney with Midwest Environmental Advocates and the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, where she focused on clean Water Act implementation and enforcement, reducing agricultural pollution and preventing drinking water contamination, and represented a broad range of individuals and communities facing water pollution problems. Without further ado, I will pass it over to Dr. Shaw. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Lauren. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. All right, there we go. So uh, I'm really pleased to be here today to talk about critical race theory and the declarations of public health um, and the connection to, to uh, public health inequities. What we're gonna be doing today is we're gonna start building connections between critical race theory and public health, as well as assessing legislative efforts to ban so-called critical race theory and the chilling effect that they have on legitimate, important discussions on systemic racism, gender disparities, and other inequities. We're also going to examine the relationship between critical race theory and the declarations of racism as a public health crisis, 
in order to provide a good foundation for understanding how a critical race theory lens can be utilized to promote public health. Critical race theories, theorists differ in their views, but Richard Delgado and Jean Stefanisic have identified four basic tenets that critical race theorists agree on. As I will discuss, these four tenets have explanatory power for understanding why vast inequities persist despite overt changes in our laws to prohibit race discrimination in a variety of public and private sectors. Critical race theory really began with a questioning of widespread assumptions that current and longstanding institutions, such as the law, operated in neutral, colorblind, objective, and rational ways just because they might be overtly race neutral. We really challenged such concepts like justice is blind. Critical race theory, or CRT, emphasizes the social nature of our institutions, how they are created from a series of culturally informed, value-laden choices, which have often been harmful to people of color and other marginalized groups. Think, for example, of marijuana laws that were dis um, disparately enforced against people of color. And now, in a lot of states, marijuana is legally sanctioned with equity measures to benefit, benefit those who had been adversely impacted. This is an, a good example of how a change in values resulted in a change in laws. It illustrates how laws and policies are not simply objective, neutral, and rational entities that we pick out from an, an objective and neutral space, but social choices that we make, some of which may operate in objective and rational ways, such as seatbelt laws, but that can later become biased, for example, only stopping unbuckled Black drivers. Critical race theory emerged as a challenge to get people to think about the role of race and racism, not just historically, but their current impacts. Racism was not being taken seriously, even by people concerned with equality and justice. So I'm going to be discussing each of these core tenets and also showing some videos because for critical race theorists, narrative plays a powerful role. So the first tenet is that racism is a norm, not the exception. It can be visible such as the recent anti-Asian violence that we've seen or, or less visible such as structural racism. It's multifaceted, it's interpersonal, structural, institutional, conscious, unconscious, or even in some cases, just indifference. Structural racism refers to race, the fact that race and racism are culturally embedded in our social and political institutions, our laws, policies, practices, and norms, and produce vast, consistent racial disparities. Critical race theory disrupts the naturalness or inevitability of these structures and the narrative that the way things are are the way things must be, that where racial inequities are taken as a given. Racism is also systemic, meaning that it occurs across wide geographic and social political institutions. And I'm gonna give a couple of examples from public health of structural systemic racism. The first example is a recent study that found that for all major emission categories, Black people are exposed to greater than average fine particulate matter pollution, PM 2.5, which is responsible for up to 200,000 excessive deaths per year in the US. People of color also have a greater than average exposure overall. This held true across the nation, across states, across income levels, and across urban and rural areas. Relatedly, in a 2020 paper by Harvard researchers that looked at long-term exposure to PM 2.5 on a county level, they concluded that a small increase in long-term exposure to PM 2.5 leads to a large increase in the COVID-19 death rate. And this is just an example of how inequities interact on a structural level to create even deeper inequities. Another example comes from the EPA's 2020 report on climate change and social vulnerability in the US, which looked at some primary climate change impacts and unjust racial disparities. 
looking at labor and wage loss due to climate change, such as extreme heat. The report concluded that Hispanics and Latinos or Latinas were 43% more likely to live in areas with the highest projected labor hour losses in weather exposed industries, such as construction and agriculture. Finally, I wanna give an example from healthcare. A study that was just published in Health Affairs motivated by higher rates of black people relative to white people who reported discrimination in healthcare, examined electronic health records in a large urban academic medical center. They found that relative to white patients, black patients had 2.54 the times the odds of having at least one negative descriptor in their history and physical notes with terms like refused, not adherent, not compliant, and agitated. And that these notes had negative continuing consequences on their care. For example, not taking someone's pain seriously. Importantly, the researchers recommended as a policy solution, implicit bias training, which would be a problem under a lot of CRT bans. Um, when we say racism is not the norm, is a norm, not the exception. Another important uh, insight from critical race theory is the point of intersection, intersectionality, which says that we need to look at how systems interact to create unique forms of oppression that are not based on one aspect of people's identity, such as race or gender. Kimberly Crenshaw gives the following analogy, stating that discrimination, like traffic through an intersection, may flow in one direction and it may flow in another. If an accident happens in an intersection, it can be caused by cars traveling from any number of directions and sometimes from all of them. An example of intersectionality comes from the Trevor Project's 2021 National Survey on LGBTQ Youth Mental Health. There it found that these youth had high rates of reported suicide attempts. However, Native American and Alaska Native Black youth and youth of more than one race or ethnicity had the highest rates compared to other racial groups. So this shows that you can't simply lump individuals together based on one aspect of their identity, but it's important to understand these difference, differences. And as you can see, many of these examples drawn from the tenets of critical race theory align with public health evidence-based approach. The second tenet is that racism produces psychic and material benefits for dominant groups and the converse for non-dominant groups. Some examples from public health include the impacts of climate change, such as what I just mentioned, and the impacts of COVID-19, which are well known. But just to reiterate a common statistic, Native American and Alaska Native, Black people and Hispanic and Latino, Latina people are more likely to die from COVID-19 than white non-Hispanic persons. There's also an example that comes from having access to cultural healing. Cultural healing means having access to healing practices that reflect your culture. For example, the, the inability to hold smudging ceremonies in hospitals or having access to traditional cultural foods that are considered healing. When you go to a hospital cafeteria, you see things like Jello and other westernized um, food items. There's also the issue of internalized stereotypes. The concept of race has contributed to widespread negative stereotypes that people of color actively have to overcome to create positive images. This aspect of racism, the internal experience, can sometimes get overlooked in discussions about racism. So I'm gonna share a video here, which is a trailer to a short seven minute video by the Kenyan director, Nagundo Mukai, examining the impact of racial stereotypes, what she refers to as the Western gaze on the self image of young girls and women. My sister and I are teenagers. We are having our hair braided at the hair salon. 
my magazine is on my lap because it hurts too much to read. The woman tugging on my hair is Amkorogo, meaning she could only afford enough beauty cream to bleach her hands and face, which are now yellow. Her true ebony persists on the length of her upper arms, the bow of her stomach, the breadth of her thighs. I see the West seeing us, and in response, this woman had worked hard to erase the element that marks her as truly African. Her own melanin, her own skin. So this this trailer provides a brief but powerful narrative of the damage that internalized racial stereotypes can do to a person's sense of self, sense of identity in ways that extend beyond just simply beauty norms. The third tenet is that race is a social construct with a social purpose. And this uh, directly connects to the concept of internalized stereotypes that I just mentioned. Race is not a biological category, it's a social construct and that uh, is no longer seriously contested by anyone. So if it's a social construct, you need to ask what is its social purpose? What's the work that it's doing? Why does it exist? From a critical race theory perspective, you can say that it's to attribute values, abilities, and other characteristics, which then have broad ranging impacts. It's that power of the narrative that tell us, tells us who's rational, who has power, who gets to define culture. What does the ideal man, woman, mother, father look like? And what is racism and what is anti-racism? Who has the authority to define these terms? Finally, the fourth tenet is that people of color possess unique knowledge about racism based on their lived experience. The people with the authority to speak on racism and related inequities and exclusions are people of color, people from non-dominant cultures. But that knowledge is often treated as marginal, uninformed, and mistaken, even when there's collective consensus. Some dominant discourses continue to treat racism as if it's non-existent, or as if it can only be one thing, intentional conscious discrimination. Such discourses presume the ability to define what racism is and impose that viewpoint on otherized communities of color who are incapable of articulating their own experiences or even understanding those experiences, the silencing effect. This is what happened to the, for decades with the Washington football team. Native Americans had to fight to get people to understand why the former team na name of the team was racist and demeaning. This was done in this video that I'm gonna show using the power of narrative and imagery. This is an ad that played online during the Super Bowl in 2014. Proud, forgotten, Indian. Navajo, Blackfoot, Inuit, and Sioux. Survivor, spiritualist, patriot. Sitting Bull, Hiawatha, and Jim Thorpe. Mother, father, son, daughter, chief. Apache, Pueblo, Chumpto, Chippewa, and Crow. Underserved, struggling, resilient. <laughs> 
articulates not only the insight that can be gained when people of color speak for themselves, but the powerful role that narrative plays in both reinforcing racism, but also disrupting racism. It took 87 years for the team to change its name, which happened in 2020. So I'm gonna switch gears now and examine so-called critical race theory bans. So Education Week has been tra tracking efforts to ban critical race theory and discussions of systemic inequities, um, particularly gender um, across the states. They found that 32 states as of January 12th have introduced bills enacting some measure to restrict lessons on race and gender. 13 so far have implemented bans and some of these states have done so legislatively. This includes Idaho, Iowa, New Hampshire, North Dakota, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Texas. And a few other states have done so through other me means, including Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Montana, and Utah. These bans typically target K through 12, but they also, some of them also target higher education and certain governmental trainings. The pivotal point in real, that really ignited these trends to ban critical race theory was the 2020 executive order combating race and sex stereotyping. This order was revoked in 2021, but it continues to operate as a model for state and other le state level efforts and other efforts. And what the order did was one of the key part of it was that it banned um, 11 divisive concepts which it claimed were uh, common in federal diversity trainings and which were linked to critical race theory. And what you see in the state legislation is, is that a lot of them just copy and paste either all of these divisive concepts or um, some of them. So I'm gonna just go through them here. The, to begin with, one race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex. The U.S. is fundamentally racist or sexist. An individual by virtue of his or her race or sex is inherently sex, uh, racist, sexist, or oppressive, consciously or unconsciously. An individual should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment solely or partly because of her race or sex. Members of one race or sex cannot and should not attempt to treat others without respect to an individual's moral character is necessarily determined by his or her race or sex. An individual by virtue of his or her race or sex bears responsibility for actions committed in the past by other members of the same race or sex. Any individual should feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any other form of psychological dis distress on account of her, his or her race or sex. Meritocracy or traits such as hard work ethic are racist or sexist or were created by a particular race to oppress another race. Any other form of race or sex stereotyping, any other form of race or sex scapegoating. And the latter two are, were defined in the executive order. So what the order did was it largely prohibited a fictionalized characterization of what CRT is. Um, the network has created a resource highlighting some of the problems with this executive order, including that it contradicts public health findings and trends, including the declarations of racism as a public health crisis and numerous examples of structural and systemic racism that can't be explained on an individual level. It also has had a chilling effect on legitimate and important and necessary discourses about racism. So one of the questions that came up after the order was whether it, implicit bias training would be prohibited. The Department of Labor issued a guidance saying, quote, unconscious or implicit bias training is prohibited to the extent it teaches or implies that an individual by virtue of his or her race, sex, and or national origin is racist, sexist, oppressive, or biased, whether consciously or unconsciously. This guidance raised serious questions about what would fall under this category. What are objective and reasonable criteria? If I had shown the two videos that I had just shown during a training, 
would this be in violation of this definition? Turning back to the state efforts to ban critical race theory, here I've just identified some of the state legislative elements that we find. Uh, it's often framed as anti-discrimination legislation. There asserts that the legislation promotes respect and dignity. Usually instruction on trainings on past or historical discrimination is generally okay, as long as it's kept in the past and conceives of racism as individual prejudice. And in some cases, there's a funding pen penalty um, for any violations. To make this more concrete, I just wanted to share some of the examples of the legislation that's been passed. And so this comes from North Dakota. And this is curriculum, critical race theory prohibited. prohibited. It says each school district and public school shall ensure instruction of its curriculum is factual objective and aligned to the kindergarten through grade 12 state st content standards. A school district or public school may not include instruction relating to critical race theory in any portion of the district's required curriculum or any other curriculum offered. For the purpose of this section, critical race theory means the theory that racism is not merely the product of learned individual bias or prejudice, but that racism is systemically embedded in American society and the American legal system to facilitate racial inequality. So here we see very clearly the theme that racism can only be individual prejudice and a rejection of structural and systemic racism. Here's an example of official testimony that was submitted in support of this legislation um, in North Dakota. The most damaging effects of such instruction fall on lower income minority who are implicitly told that they are helpless victims with no power or agency to shape their own futures while other students are told they are oppressors simply because of the color of their skin. The tenets of CRT are incredibly divisive and damaging, particularly to young children. So this assertion positions the legislation as a protective shield for children of color against the damage of CRT, which makes them helpless victims. This brings us back to the point of who has the authority to define what racism is and to tell their, their stories. The movement to ban CRT is not coming from community color, communities of color. The second example says, although critical race theory is not officially in the curriculum of our local school district, many element, elements of it are already present. We recently completed a Boy Scout trip to the Black Hills. During the course of our hike, when we climbed Black Elk Peak, my son was explaining to other scouts what he learned at school. We white people had apparently stolen the Black Hills from the native tribes. This kind of polarizing teaching is unnecessary and untrue and is at the core of CRT. I didn't steal the Black Hills, nor did my ancestors. HB 1508 will assist in preventing some of these misunderstandings and untruths. So here we just see an outright denial of history, um, an unwillingness to connect the dots between past and present inequities and reducing CRT to theory about just individual blame, making it easy to dismiss. The last example that I wanted to provide is from legislation that passed in Idaho, the dignity and non-discrimination in public education provision. Here, the Idaho legislature finds that the tenants outlined in the subsection of this section found in CRT undermines the objectives of to respect the dignity of others, acknowledge the right of others to express differing opinions, and foster and defend intellectual honesty, freedom of inquiry and instruction, and freedom of speech and association, and exacerbate and inflames divisions on the basis of sex, race, ethnicity, religion, color, national origin, or other criteria in ways contrary to the unity of the nation and the well-being of the state of Idaho and its citizens. And you can see that directly, the three tenants down there are directly taken from the executive order. This portrayal of critical race theory doesn't square with the four tenants that I just discussed earlier, 
um, in fact, critical race theory is to, to combat systems that treat people as inferior or superior on the basis of race. The takeaway here is that although legislative efforts are to ban CRT are not representative of what CRT is, they nonetheless have a chilling effect on discussions of systemic inequities outright saying that critical race theory is dangerous. Many people don't have direct experience with CRT, but they're being told that it will damage their children, divide coworkers, and threaten the nation as a whole. This is not a movement by people of color. In fact, recent demonstrations have shown that communities of color want to have these discussions about systemic racism and other inequities. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and pass it to Betsy. Hi, everyone. I'm not here I'm trying to share my screen. Yeah. All right, hopefully you can all see my screen now. Um, thanks, April. Um, and I'm really happy to be here today to talk about community, how communities are treating racism as a public health crisis and look at how some of the concepts found in declarations of racism is a public health crisis um, often reflect the four tenets of critical race theory that April just discussed. Okay, so community declarations that racism is a public health crisis are relatively recent development. So some of the first declarations were adopted in 2018, a handful more were passed in 2019, but since May of 2020, over 200 resolutions have been passed by cities and counties and states, and they're across the country really. Um, the declarations have been issued in a 37 states and also the District of Columbia. So in most places, these declarations come in the form of a formally adopted resolution or a declaration passed by the governing body of the local government. Um, so I'm going to use the term declaration and resolution sort of interchangeably because just their, their terminology that's, that's used but is generally talking about these same types of statements about racism as a public health crisis. So the resolutions generally don't have the force of law, but they are statements of intent by the lawmaking body. Um, and in some communities, these declarations are really the first time the governmental entity has discussed racism as an institutional and structural rather than interpersonal and as a root cause of lifelong health inequities. Okay. So the resolutions and declarations often recognize the four tenets April uh, just spoke of. They recognize that racism is not an exception. And they do this by recognizing the role of law and policy in, in creating and sustaining inequities. And then declarations also identify the disparities and benefits that racism produces. And they often present evidence on really widespread health and economic disparities that result from structural and institutional racism. And third, the declarations often very clearly state specifically that race is a social construct. And they generally say that in the first few paragraphs of the actual declaration. And then finally, the fourth tenant, the declarations often emphasize the need to tap into the unique knowledge about racism that people of, of color have based on their lived experiences. And they generally promote this engagement via authentic engagement and learning from communities most impacted by structural and institutional racism and efforts to um, guide training within the government entity to ensure that staff has the capacity to authentically engage with community. So these next few slides have a lot of text on them, but they're really just meant to illustrate the general structure of the declarations and resolutions. They generally in, um, contain two sections, a preamble section and an operative section. This section um, contains, or this slide contains an example of a preamble section and of these types of declarations. And it's taken from the preamble of the declaration adopted in Cleveland, Ohio. And so you can see from this specific declaration 
These statements generally start with the term whereas, and these whereas statements include quite a few things. They generally include historical information, they identify the root causes of health disparities, they present evidence of health inequities either in the community or more broadly across the nation, and they form the basis of the actions that are proposed in the, the later section of the resolution. And then quite commonly, this section also defines racism as a social system with multiple dimensions, including structural and systemic racism, institutional racism, and interpersonal raci racism. And now every community is going to include different things <laughs> in this section, but um, they commonly address the social determinants of health, public safety or policing, premature mortality, implicit bias, generational effects of racism, chronic stress and trauma, infant and maternal health, and cult cultural competency. Here's another text heavy <laughs> slide, but this is an example from an operative section of a relatively recent resolution from Bloomington, Minnesota. So some of the declarations that were passed earlier in 2020 aren't quite as detailed because um, they required more information to be collected. They needed more data to make decisions about what the community was going to do or reports were drafted on um, to the governmental entity. So this one's fairly detailed um, and it illustrates what these look like. So generally, um, they start with the term, therefore, be it resolved, and they outline the commitments that the government body is making to address structural racism and health inequities. Well, most of these commitments are, are non-binding. This language is important because it can act to normalize the conversation around health equity. It can drive policy, planning, and budgeting efforts, and oftentimes those are some of the commitments that are made. Um, it definitely focuses on an increase of the use of racial equity tools, and it can be used as an accountability reminder if policies or outcomes diverge from the commitments um, made and the evidence that's cited within the declaration. Um, it's, this section generally includes some important first steps in calling attention to racism um, in a way that can drive resource allocation and changes to law and policy. So um, my colleagues, Don Hunter and Maddie Kim from the Network for Public Health Law and I have done a comprehensive review of the resolu resolutions and declarations that have been adopted across the nation. And we've noted some common themes um, that we've identified in this, in this slide. And some typical components, most declarations, um, well, all declarations have a clear declaration that racism is a public health crisis or emergency. And then most of the declarations have um, measures pertaining to organizational policy or practice. So things like implicit bias training and incorporating anti-racism principles. Um, most declarations also emphasize partnerships and accountability or, and include accountability measures. And some focus on very specific issues that are impacting that community in a particular way. And so this varies by community, but can, can include things like the need for data collection, adverse childhood experiences, health and all policies, trauma, public safety, or policing. Um, most of the declarations also put out a call to action for other state, local, and national leaders to address racism as a public health crisis. And then finally, most, but certainly not all, <laughs> include um, funding or infrastructural proposals. And this is a really important piece to ensure that the actions that are committed to actually come, um, come to be um, as the declarations are being implemented. So this slide here has some examples of some of the specific actions that are recommended in the declarations. The data um, is the top one here, and it is really important to improve data collection in a lot of communities um, and actually find a way to use that data to inform action. Other examples of recommended actions are um, identifying activities to increase diversity in the government workforce or in leadership positions, assess policies and procedures using a racial equity tool related to things like hiring, promotion, leadership appointments, vendor selection, grant management and budget allocation or funding decisions. Um, they often create task forces or committees that um, are can partner with um, external partners and ensure that the work keeps moving forward. 
And all of these declarations really importantly focus on the role of community. It's one of the most important pieces because communities, the communities that are most impacted must be the ones that identify and lead solutions. So I'm gonna to turn to two specific issues that are um, regularly in, um, discussed in declarations. Um, and those are the social determinants of health and authentic community engagement. So the social determinants of health are the economic, environmental, and social conditions that impact health outcomes. Uh, they're important factors. They include things like access to safe, safe and stable housing, social connection, education, economic stability, neighborhood and infrastructure, and healthcare and access to food systems. And the social determinants of health are recognized as even more important than healthcare in determining both longevity and health during a lifetime. And this depiction of the social determinants of health was created by Rukaya Yerby. She's a professor at St. Louis University School of Law and the executive director of the Institute for Healing Justice and Equity. And I like this depiction because it includes not just the social determinants of health, but also the root causes and tools that contribute to health outcomes and health inequities. The root causes include structural discrimination, racism, sexism, ageism, and the tools include political and budgetary and legal tools. And so these structures and laws and systems impact health equity both across lifespans and across generations. Um, so many of the declarations, as I mentioned, look really broadly at the social determinants of health and consider all types of laws and policies that can impact health outcomes. They often provide significant amounts of evidence of disparities in the social determinants of health associated with racism and inequitable systems. And four of the most common issues that are addressed um, related to the social determinants of health are housing, access to housing, generational wealth, environmental racism, and healthcare. So for housing, um, one common, um, this is one common theme that is often referred to in these declarations. And many declarations cite to evidence of discriminatory lending and redlining and home denial rates, gentrification and racially restrictive covenants as contributing to low rates of home ownership in communities of color. So these are the systems and the laws and the policies um, that create that create these um, inequitable outcomes. And they also address housing instability and safety, things like rent burdens and exclusionary zoning, increased rates of lead poisoning, limited access to clean water, and disinvestment in communities of color. And while they cite this information, they also try to create solutions or at least get the ball rolling in addressing some of these inequities. So one example I like to cite too is the city of Fayetteville, Arkansas. And um, related to housing, uh, the city committed to working to eliminate displacement during neighborhood development and also to increase affordable housing and community-based infrastructure using community development block grants. Um, environmental racism is another very common theme. Um, and, it, and most uh, declarations talk about um, environmental racism as it affects the community directly. So things like siting of toxic facilities in or, near, in or near neighborhoods of color and unsafe housing conditions. Some of the most common pollutants discussed in these declarations are lead exposure um, and inequitable exposure to air quality. Let's see here. So now I'm gonna turn a little bit to focus on community engagement. So many, Declarations also focus on creating a path to what's hopefully authentic community engagement. Um, as I mentioned before, it's really important that the most impacted communities are, are leading the strategies and identifying um, what work um, should be done in the future. So many of the declarations uh, build the capacity of community members to lead conversations about racism and equity. Um, they include community voices and policy making and remove barriers to participation. Um, really assessing what those barriers work and are can sometimes be a difficult process to start. Um, and then they create pathways to engagement in community wide racial equity strategies. 
so well, now that you, there's so many declarations, what happens? What happens now? Um, well, certainly um, the goal is that these declarations will be a catalyst to addressing health inequities stemming from racism, not just a piece of paper that identifies the problems in the communities. Um, and founding and accountability is really important to ensuring that the measures that are committed to in the declarations are achieved. Um, each jurisdiction is at a different stage of implementation, but some communities have since taken pretty big action. Some have developed racial equity plans and new programs and policies fo focused on health equity. Um, I'm just gonna go through a couple examples here. So Akron, Ohio established a racial equity and social justice task force to move their work along. The Buncombe, Buncombe County, New North Carolina approved a racial equity action plan in June of 2021. And in Milwaukee County, Wisconsin. So Milwaukee was one of the earlier communities to adopt a, or to declare racism as a public health crisis in 2019. They followed that declaration with an audit of racial and gender equity issues within the county's workforce, the adoption of a health and equity framework, um, and they also adopted an ordinance that requires the county to employ a workforce that reflects the county's demographics, consult with frontline communities on policy development, uh, monitor and evaluate uh, the impact of the strategic plan, and use racial equity tools to evaluate the impact of decisions. So there is some work happening um, after these declarations are adopted. And again, they're in various stages, but there is um, various stages of progress. New laws are being um, developed and plans and strategies are being developed as well. So while often these declarations can sort of put a community on a path to beginning to review some of their inequitable, the inequitable impacts of their laws and policies, um, many declarations also focus on providing needed training on the effects of structural racism. But as April just mentioned, anti-CRT legislation can really have a powerful chilling effect on some of, some of these activities. And because the declarations sort of often reflect the CRT tenants um, by acknowledging systemic racism as a key driver in health inequities. So this slide here, I just wanted to give an example. This is um, a declaration and a state law in the same community. Um, and, and the declaration does talk about institutional and systemic racism and the need for implicit bias training um, and inclusion and equity in organizational practices. Uh, but the state law also uses that terminology about race and sex stereotyping and race or sex scapegoating and prohibits training um, that would um, raise those issues. And while I don't think that these are in direct conflict, you can certainly see how they can have a chilling, the state law could have a chilling effect um, on some of these declarations as racism, um, of racism as a public health crisis. All right, so that's sort of all for me and then wrap it up and maybe move on to questions for April and I. I will stop sharing my screen here. Okay, um, so here's a, a question, um, and it looks like Betsy, maybe this is one for you. It says, if there is agreement that nutrition is the basis for healthy living, is anyone putting money toward fighting our horrible quality of food in this country? Yes, there are. Um many efforts that are um, directed at ensuring access to um, healthy foods in all communities. And we know there's sort of vast inequities within cities and counties about access to healthy foods. Um, and we have seen some changes, I, you know, in the ability to provide um, healthy foods via SNAP programs on the federal level. 
Um, and also during the COVID-19 pandemic, some communities um, took actions to try to address some of the um, health inequities that they were seeing. And one of the one of the very common things was providing healthy food um, and culturally relevant food. And so there was government, uh, local governments that were partnering with um, local food distribution sites to ensure that um, healthy foods that were you know culturally relevant were getting to people in the community. Um, and, and so the, I think that's one effort to highlight. Um, I think there are some other efforts out here, uh, out there as well. I'm gonna look here and see if there's any more. Well, there's not a lot of questions <laughs> that have come in, um, have come in this far. Um, so if you have, okay, we're getting a clarification on that question. Um, so the, the person that just asked that question clarified about talking, holding accountable the companies that uh, produce food and food products, um, which in a lot of cases can cause disease in, in many people. Um, and I am not as familiar with anything that's happening on that level. Um, I am, um, more knowledgeable about things like ensuring that foods don't have pesticides in them. And that's been sort of a long road, but there is some progress being made because those pesticides can then have a, you know, a negative impact on the people that are eating the food. Um, so there have, has been quite a bit of litigation around um, that issue and toxic substances in food. Um, but other than that, I'm not sure I have any, um, any more good knowledge to share on that particular issue. So feel free to enter your questions into the chat. So a question is, how do you practice self-care doing this heavy and important work? Um, I can take the first go at that question. I think, you know, as as we've seen, states and counties and other organizations have really, since 2020, ramped up their racial equity work and their efforts to really address racism in a way that just wasn't addressed nationally at all. I think most people agree that really it was like a cultural awakening. And this is happening at the same time that as I pointed out, this anti-CRT legislation so is going forward. And really there's like this, this kind of like parallel momentum to, to ban these discussions. And so self-care at this time is really important for those that are, you know, interested in racial and gender equity and all of these other issues. Um, how do you practice self-care? I think that's a really good question. I think that from what I've seen, um, you know, my own personal life is realizing that self care just has to be part of like your work week, your work day. Um, can't really wait for things to slow down for self care, keeping ourselves, you know, healthy, keeping our taking care of our mental health is really important. Is just just as important as working on these um, these issues. So. It, what that looks like for people will, of course, vary. But the lesson that I've learned is, you know, it it's time to build it into our our schedules now, um, and not wait for things to kind of slow down. Betsy, I don't know if you had anything to add to that. I think that was great, <laughs> April. It, it can be really hard, right? Um, I know, I, I, April, are any of the um, resources you've been working on about mental health and work um, relevant to, to that question? Because we know that there are a lot of um, jobs that have become increasingly more stressful <laughs> during the last couple of years. Right. So I think, I mean, I do think it's something that employers are starting to, to think through how to support that balance and even the balance for people that are working remotely, you know, that divide between home and work can be really 
challenging. Um, I think it is it is something that people are trying to sort of think through, especially, for example, the public health workforce, which is really burnt out. Attorneys um, are often really burnt out. So it like other things, I, I feel like it's this emerging kind of cultural awakening to the importance of addressing this now. Oh, let's see here. Any questions are coming in. Do you want to do the next question, Betsy? Or? Sure. Let's see. Um, let's see. This is a, there's a lot of misinformation regarding critical race theory um, and its movement into the educational system. Given that change in thinking for a lot of us, are there resources available to learn more and how to support? This is a large change in thinking for a lot of us, and it is difficult to wrap your head around a different way of thinking. Right, so at the network, we've created a couple of resources. Um, as I mentioned, if you go to the network website, and I, I link to it in, in one of the slides on the exec, federal executive order, we have a resource analyzing that order, um, also a blog on critical race theory and just the importance of you know, not, not being scared to have these discussions, right? So a lot of times people will point out to maybe one particular lesson that they didn't like and say, this is critical race theory and it should be banned. And, you know, really if they're just at, with anything else, if there's a lesson that goes wrong or that there's dispute about the, the solution is to have a dialogue and come up with a better lesson, have a discussion, not just um, silence these um, discussions. And then the, four tenants that I cite in the second slide, and I believe this, the slides will be available uh, by, comes from um, a book written by Richard Delgado and Jean Stefanisic, and they provide like a really good brief, short summary of some of the major themes of critical race theory. So I think that would be a, a good starting point. Okay. I was on mute. Um, someone has asked for some links to some of these resources, and I can look for those, um, April, because I think this next question is probably best. Um, I think this is for you. Uh, what is happening to reverse the executive order and related CRT bans? What's the status of such efforts, and what could we do to help? And I'll look for those other resources. Yeah, so I mean, right now, the the federal executive order was revoked so that was issued under the trump administration um biden revoked it um almost immediately after he he took office so so like it has no actual like legal implications but the problem is that it's 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 living on through the state legislation and really has spurred this momentum to ban critical race theory and i think that that unfortunately what we're seeing is that more and more states are introducing legislation to ban discussions on race and gender and systemic inequity. So unfortunately the trend is to kind of get these bans in place. I think as far as what you can do, you know, schools, um, that first uh, testimony that I, I read to you that was pretty much a cut and paste. You, a lot of people submitted the exact same testimony. So there, it's a really an organized effort to um, you know, get these bans in place. And so um, I know that schools, for example, are inundated with, with these types of, of letters and stuff. So um, I would say the strategy is to, to educate yourself on what critical race theory is, to educate other people on what it is, and to, you know, if you're concerned about suppression in any one area, to contact, you know, the school or whoever you think is, is would play a role in kind of helping to combat that misinformation. So it is two o'clock. Um, I know the time went 
incredibly fast, but I do want to thank both of you for leading this conversation. Um, and Betsy has put some links into the chat as well if you all want to follow up there. Um, again, we will post the recording of this event on our website within a few days so you can access that. Um, how would folks reach out to you all? What would be the best place if they want to connect with you? So I can put my um, address, email, in the chat. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you. I'll do the same. And our website should have our um, information as well. It does. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for uh, engaging with us today. Please reach out and continue to follow us. Please fill out your evaluation so that we can know how to continue to offer um, amazing um, events to you in this way. Have a great rest of your day.